Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Cultivating Psychological Safety at Work. We're going to let folks join, um, and we'll get started at about 1133. In the meantime, uh, Ciara has put up a warm up for us. Who is your business therapist? Uh, maybe you have no idea what that means, and you can put that in the chat box. Or maybe there's uh, someone that immediately springs to mind. So uh, get your snacks and your drinks. Uh, think about that question and we'll get started here shortly. Oh, Susan's adding that her husband is a good business therapist. It's nice when we have a partner that can be a sounding board. CR is reminding us that this is meant to be super interactive. So share your insights throughout. I'll say more about this later, but uh, Ciara has been a business therapist to me, which is why um, she's featured on the show today. And you'll figure out why that is uh, once she gets started here momentarily. And let's be real. Um, many of you have probably already spent the morning on Zoom calls. And uh, this is not at all the same as if we could go down to 52. Uh, Elaine's a fantastic uh, uh, coordinator and, and community partner. And they host a lot of events uh, there when we're when we're doing that, and I'm sure we'll be doing that again. Um, so we can pretend we're looking over uh, the bagels or the snacks and figuring out if there's anything that's low carb or gluten free, um, judging the coffee and figuring out if they have good creamer or oat milk or whatever. Um, so we can pretend all that. Uh, and I, this will be as close a second to that experience as it can be. I can promise it'll be really interactive and you're gonna get not only good content, but good vibes. Um, thank you. Uh, another contribution here that our employees are a great sounding board. So I think, uh, let's see, we've got about a 30 of us here. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, let's see here, bring up my notes, right? Um, welcome everyone to our monthly series, Cultivating Psychological Safety at Work. We are really glad you're here with us today. Before we make introductions, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. For those of us in Portland, we are on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. Please join us in acknowledging the land and the indigenous people who have cared for it. I am Lori Everly, founder of Radius Executive Coaching and Development and the author of Fuckery. My pronouns are she and hers. I'm a clinical social worker by training, currently using these skills as an executive coach and facilitator. We also provide workplace mediation services and organizational assessments. This series is a direct response to the enormous threats that 2020 has thrown at us. Every month, we bring you an expert to improve emotional intelligence, teach trust building skills, and enhance belonging at work, because we need each other now more than ever. Next month, we'll feature Crystal Nagini, followed by Cage Leitner and Kathleen Holt in the new year. Tickets to Crystal's events will be emailed to you later today, along with a version of Ciara's slides. And now I'd like to kick it over to Elaine, who has been a tremendous support to Radius. Thanks so much, Lori. Um, and thank you everyone for joining today. My name is Elaine Shea. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at 52 Limited. 52 Limited is a local creative and tech staffing agency. Um, we are so pleased to partner with Lori and Radius for this event series because our community consists of talent, 
and clients, and prospects, and all of everyone in between. And as Lori mentioned, in this year um, and at this time, it's really important that more than ever that businesses, leaders know how to kind of navigate um, the world that we live in and to build trust, to bring teams together. Um, and regardless of where you are in the grand scheme of things of the hierarchy of your company, um, we all wanna feel good about where we work and how we work together. And I think a lot of the topics that we talk about aren't just relevant in the workplace, but as well in, in your communities. Um, understanding each other, how to be good to each other and how to be productive, I think is a really important, um, it's really important to think about in this time during this time and navigating that. So I just appreciate this partnership and really excited about CRR today. So thank you. Thank you, Elaine. It's now my pleasure to introduce you all to Ciara Pressler, who has been my business coach and a friend over the last several years. Ciara is the founder of Pregame and the author of Game Plan, Achieve Your Goals in Life, Career, and Business. She has worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs, executives, managers, and creative professionals to create their game plan for success. Ciara has created and collaborated on professional development programs for teams at MTV, A&E Networks, Condé Nast, Hearst, Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia, Travel Portland, Dubspot DJ School, Wanderlust, and for coaching firms across the US and internationally. Good morning, Ciara. And uh, you can say hello or get yourself off mute. I do want to clarify the format um, before we totally turn the mic over to you. Just to remind all of you uh, participating us, with us today, Ciara will present for about an hour and we'll take questions formally around 1235. Please add your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, um, excuse me. Um, Ciara and I will not be managing the chat. Elaine will take that over uh, during this presentation, but we really want to make sure we get your questions. So those go in the Q&A. Uh, a version of the slides will be sent to you later and want to remind you all that this webinar is being recorded. Ciara, over to you. Thanks, Lori, and thanks, Elaine. Um, it's truly an honor to be here. And with all of you, I just scanned through the attendee list and some, some names that I recognize and most that I don't. So I look forward to connecting with you or meeting you at some point in time, I hope you can see my name in the corner of my screen. So please request me on LinkedIn if you'd like to connect after this. So let's get into some psychological safety through building trust on teams. And there will be some interaction in this and there will be Q&A. This is also a very visual presentation. And so um, I know some of you are probably trying to multitask and do several things in several browser windows. You might want to stick with this one or at least have it <laughs> a window paned out with anything else that you're doing so you can see what we're up to here. I'm going to share my screen with you. My warm-up question for you, and you can drop this in the chat, was who's your business therapist? So what do I mean by that? You may have hired professional help to deal with your job, um, but who are the people you trust to give you feedback when you are experiencing challenges at work? So um, just to get you in the zone to think about what we are going to cover today, I want you to think about who do you trust? Who do you go to uh, with your challenges? Um, they may not be negative. It might just be maybe deciding between two amazing job offers or um, just you're at a fork in the road with your decision making, who do you go to for um, advice? Lori mentioned, I wrote a book called Game Plan, Achieve Your Goals in Life, Career, and Business. And in one of the chapters, I talk about your advisory. So who are the advisors in every area of your goals, not just your career, but maybe also your business? Who do you allow to give you feedback and hint it's not, and it should be everybody. <laughs> not everybody has good or sound advice in every area. And so you wanna pick your advisors carefully. So thinking about who is that person that you trust. Um, Lori has been somebody I've learned to trust and built trust with over time. And, um, and she, as she mentioned, has trusted me with uh, decision making and pivots in her business especially this year when we've all been doing some sort of pivot, whether it's been going from in-person to virtual or changing our entire business model for this post-COVID world. 
building trust is bigger and more important than ever because we are all somewhat hidden. You don't know if I'm wearing pants right now. I am, don't worry. <laughs> but we have to build all new trust working remotely and we're gonna talk about that more. All right, uh, as was mentioned, my name is Ciara Pressler. And if I say anything astounding or insightful today, please tag me as you tweet it. And my, uh, my handle on all things social media is the mayoress, city to be determined. All right, so our topic today is accelerating trust on teams. Look at how many trust trusting people there are in this room. Everyone's happy, everyone's laughing. Um, this is from an event I put together about seven years ago for the grand opening of a co-working space um, when we were giving people training on building strategic partnerships. So what you see here is not a stock photo, but in fact, real life trust building happening right before your very eyes. So part of the premise of my work is that American culture doesn't set us up for success. Now, as good Portlanders, as many of us are, we are probably somewhat critical as to the structures of uh, traditional American culture. And this year has seen a lot of upending and exposing of the things that don't work in our culture. But the thing I've been preoccupied with for the past 10 plus years of my uh, being a, um, uh, an amateur and then professional success investigator is how does American culture contribute to or take away from us creating our own success? And part of um, that journey has been encouraging others to redefine what success means. Um, of course, there's always the traditional idea of the American dream, um, which was a very narrow idea of what success looks like or at least the ability to pursue happiness. Um, but a lot of the American myth uh, of the hero or the person achieving success is very individualistic. Um, it's that idea of that, you know, lone ranger of that John Wayne character, like riding out west to find his fortune of that guy like climbing the mountain and pitching the flag or maybe the moon man. And we always neglect all the other people who made that possible. Of course, there wasn't just one person who went to the moon. It took an entire team to get him there and his partner. Um, and especially these days in entrepreneurial culture and, and in business culture, um, I've watched with great interest as the current um, wave of startups and startup success has happened in American culture. Um, if I ever have a TED talk someday, it will be called Entrepreneurs Are the New Rock Stars because we used to um, edify these, these rock stars and buy tickets to their concerts. And now what we do is pay a lot of money to go to TED talks <laughs> where people spread um, their ideas. And we act like these entrepreneurs had no help in getting to where they are. And let's acknowledge it's often alone white male <laughs> achieving the success. And so we really haven't evolved a lot in this American ideal of what success looks like, right? It's usually this one person who gets all the credit for a successful idea or business, right? It's Steve Jobs, it's Elon Musk, it's Bill Gates, um, all the people who, you know, it's um, Mark Zuckerberg. It's all the people who are creating these things. We act as though, their success happened in a vacuum when in fact it took an entire ecosystem to get there and they never could have had the success they had without a team, whether that team is recognized or not. But I suspect if you were attracted to an, uh, a presentation like this, you are the kind of person who believes in the power of teams. And so I want to dissect for you today what makes teams work. So first we need to think about what creates trust? So this is some, a place where I would really like to hear from you, uh, whether you'd like to raise hands or drop in the chat box. Um, for you in a team, what are the circumstances that create trust on a team?
vulnerability I see. I know we're moderating too. Uh, transparency. So I absolutely agree with those, but I would love to hear, um, you know, those are words we hear a lot these days. So um, even if you have specific examples, that would be great. Consistency, that's a big one. I can depend on you when you do what you say you're going to do it, do it over and over. Ooh, good communication. Love that. We, are, we, have, we have someone who's raised their hand. So I'm going to let, I'm going to give the mic to Aaron for just a moment. Great. Oh, hi. <laughs> I just wasn't following directions correctly. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. We're creating an environment of trust for you. And yes, that's what I like to I talk. Was just gonna add feel feel safe to Jerry. And I do feel safe, <laughs> Jerry. So thank you. Good. Good. Yeah. And what creates trust for you and, and safety in a group? Um, definitely feeling safe sharing. Um, and yeah. I know that I can pinpoint, I think it's partly that experience when you join a new organization and as you enter into those waters, you kind of feel, you know, you're paying attention to who you feel comfortable um, in that sense, feeling safe with. Um, and, well, you know, I don't know, it, it's sort of more intuitive. Um, you know, if you see, for example, if you see somebody rolling their eyes, um, you know, a tell for me. It's like, oh, okay, they're not really engaged and listening. Um, so I think it's that piece of um, just mutual respect, um, good listening, and but that that safety for me is really critical in terms of the trust. Yeah, and, thank you so much, Erin. That's great. And Ciara, I want to add, it's so interesting, like sort of the themes we had back to back, follow through, consistency, accountability, and doing what you say, which to me are also like about integrity and how important that is in establishing trust. Yeah, yeah. Are there any examples of what that looks like? So these are really big words and concepts, they're value words. Um, is there a specific like action that people might take that builds trust? Um, communication is getting closer to that. Madeline adds that she feels like she can be herself and not just her work self. And that if she makes a mistake, I assumed she, this person, I don't know Madeline's pronouns, that they can make a mistake and or fail and it's okay, um, not marked for, for my mistakes. Okay, yeah. Listening, that's a huge one, right? When people are actually listening to you and you feel heard. Yeah, yeah. These are great. Um, let's definitely save the chat from this because there's a lot of extra great stuff on here. Um, I want to take it beyond trust though. Um, so we're talking about what creates trust. Um, and trust to me is just the first part of the story. So trust is great, trust builds a team, but at, at work, in business, we need the teams to do something, right? Uh, without action, uh, we don't really have a business. So the teams are designed to accomplish something. So taking it beyond trust and into action, that's what sets a business team apart from maybe a personal team. Uh, your teams in your life, like your family and your friends or other communities you're part of. So what inspires you or what has inspired you, especially in the workplace, to be in action, to take action? What makes you feel safe enough to maybe take a bold step or, or step out of your comfort zone, unlike you have before? and seeing respect. Ooh, being my own boss. Nothing will make you take action like <laughs> having no, no one else to pass the buck to. When the buck stops here, you better be taking action, right? What else uh, inspires you to take action? Yeah, outside encouragement for sure. Letting go of the expectations of the outcomes. I heard that. Yeah. 
Do you see clear expectations and goals, which is something we certainly talk about regularly at pregame? Here's another one for clarity of goals. Yeah. Knowing what you're taking action on. Um, that was a big topic last week at pregame. Not being micromanaged. Yeah. Having some freedom of action, maybe just knowing the, the lines in which you're able to play. Yeah. Having an understanding whether it's explicit or implicit that mistakes can be part of the process. Ooh, acknowledging the work that was done. Yeah, getting getting praise for your effort as well as your results. That's a good one. All right, thank you for those. So as we have hinted at, um, I have been on a journey uh, in my 20 plus year career to um, figure out what creates success. And uh, as I mentioned before, I don't think success can be achieved in a vacuum. I think uh, success takes other people and it, it requires a team, whatever that team may look like. Even if you are a freelancer or self-employed or a one person business um, or a department of one as it may be, or even job seeking as you may be doing uh, with your connection to 52 Limited, um, still need a team of people around you, right? You might have people you're outsourcing, you might have your recruiter, you might have someone helping you with placement, uh, you might have uh, vendors, coaches, advisors, mentors. It always takes a team. None of us are completely in a vacuum. So over the past 20 years of my very loop-de-loop -loop career, <laughs> they often say success is not a straight line, it's a squiggle. And mine has definitely been a squiggle, but um, it's been part of building an equation of, um, of what helps people become successful. Because I have known since before my career started that my life's mission, my purpose was to help people um, figure out where they want to go and help them get on the path to getting there. And so all of my work has been some form of that. So what I want to do is take you through my journey, <laughs> a little highlight reel, and show you what I learned from each experience. And um, this is to just show you different best practices I learned for creating trust and action on teams from every um, stage I've had in my career, but also to show you that maybe if you're earlier on in your career or in your business journey, that it doesn't necessarily happen overnight. Um, it can take 20 years to build that thing that encompasses all of your experience. And that if it seems like your career doesn't make sense um, and is like a LinkedIn page of a lot of different experiences, that in fact, um, one experience can bring it all together eventually. So let's go on a little journey. If you'll go back in time with me, we'll start in 2001. <laughs> My first career was on the stage. That's right, I'm over here. Uh, this is me on stage in Soho, New York City in 2001. My first career was acting and producing and writing theater, um, just like we all uh, wanted to do when we were just out of college and, and ready to attack the world. Um, so that was my first career, I had so much fun, but I realized that I gained some amazing skills from starting out in the arts. Um, that people don't necessarily get in other creative careers or uh, um, other careers, period. Uh, what I've learned from being in the theater and collaborating this particular group, um, very before its time, if you think about it, was called Mixed Company, and everybody in the group was uh, multiracial and, or multicultural, and we created original theater works based on our experiences with commentary on American culture. Um, oh my goodness, we would have killed it this year, right? <laughs> so that was mixed company. Um, what I learned from, from uh, working in the theater was it's really important for everyone on the team to have clear roles. It really helps when you are cast in a role and you know which lines are yours, right? Um, it really helps to have firm deadlines, something uh, I realized that I had a skill for that many people did not when I left uh, the performing arts was having an opening night. When you know a crowd is gonna show up on December 1st, you are ready, even if it takes all night. And I was so surprised when I went into the, the corporate world 
that people felt free to miss deadlines. Like I didn't know that was an option. And so um, being really clear on when we're gonna have tech rehearsal, when we're gonna have opening night, when the show closes, um, all of those things being very clear at the beginning is a huge asset for teens being able to perform uh, at their highest, highest level. Of course, having some promise for advancement, uh, whether it's gonna be that uh, key person who can bring your career to the next level in the audience, or um, maybe future roles that might come out of this, um, having a potential for something beyond this, uh, this event by uh, performing well in this event is really important. And of course, some of that instant gratification, which you guys mentioned in the chat, applause. Applause is really helpful and we forget to stop and appreciate each other and ourselves a lot of the time. Next stop, oh, I should say, um, a big part of my professional career um, was doing improv. And if you've ever taken improv classes, I know someone on here has been a professional improviser. Um, improv runs on the rule of always say yes. So it's about being able to sort of actively brainstorm and say, yeah, how can we make this possible? Somebody is offering, offering me a version of reality or a possibility. How can I say yes to that and build on it? And then the other um, part that it's built on is always make your partner look good. So um, it's not necessarily literal, but it's like, how can we make this a win-win? How can we make sure we accept their offer so they don't look stupid on stage? Um, we wanna make sure that we keep the action always moving forward. So every time you say no or you block an offer, the scene doesn't work. So next time you're watching an improv scene, um, for example, Comedy Sports Portland, does a live Zoom show every Saturday night and they do a great job. And you can see when a scene's working versus not working is simply if the scene partner is accepting the offer that the last person just gave them. The formula is really simple, but it takes a lot of practice to develop it into sense memory. Uh, doing professional improv and taking improv classes is the single best training I did for any of my jobs, any part of my career, and I highly recommend it. Uh, the next part of my life was running marathons. I absolutely loved the structure of it, and it was a huge goal, a huge challenge, but a lot of my methodology that I use now in business consulting was developed through marathon running. Yes, that is me at mile eight of my ninth marathon, and then at mile 23 when it's a lot more painful. What I learned from marathon running and training with teens is that it's helpful to have a complete map. Um, at pregame, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Last week, our topic was multiplayer goals. How can you ensure that goals that involve multiple players um, can be more successful? And part of it is letting them know where they're going. Uh, a lot of times as leaders, as visionaries, we forget to tell other people what our vision is. So they're flying blind and we wanna make sure they know where we're gonna end up. Also um, in running and in sports, we often get matched by ability and it really can help to be around people who are going around at your same pace. Um, of course, uh, hanging out with people who are going a little faster than you or a little more advanced than you can help you push your pace as well. Um, but in general, we wanna make sure people are well matched. And then friendly competition. Uh, the thing I really love about running is that you're really competing with yourself. <laughs> until you get to that elite level. And so you're always trying to best your own time and you're trying to hack yourself basically. And so um, making sure you have some sort of measurement um, of, of how you did, and that can be a self-assessment at the end of a project, or it can be somebody else assessing you. Um, and moderators, please interrupt me if there's any chats that, that need any clarification or adding to any of this, because it's hard for me to monitor the chat while I have the presentation. I will read all of them at the end though. Next stop in my career was um, starting my first business. I uh, had a boutique marketing and PR agency out of New York and these were some of my clients. Um, and I would help people with their brand strategy and communication strategy, which I still do today. Um, and what I noticed was I started learning uh, which startups were succeeding and which ones were failing. Because I worked with a lot of entrepreneurs in a lot of different industries. Of course, I started out in the arts because that was my, my home area, but expanded soon um, to a lot of different companies that were trying to communicate with creative professionals. And so worked on their brand strategy, marketing strategy. 
And here's some things I noted between the companies that ended up being successful and those that, that didn't keep going, among many other traits, which will probably be the next book. But <laughs> um, some main thing when it comes to teams, you guys know this, hiring well. Um, hiring is half the battle. Um, making sure you have the right people and taking your time to do a thorough process um, and the right process for hiring people who really know what they're doing and can take it and run with it. And that really includes contractors. I think when we're hiring employees, we tend to be super thorough, but with contractors and vendors, there's a real lack a lot of the time of vetting people um, in a way that really makes sense. And so since most of my clients are still small businesses and entrepreneurs, I encourage them to comparison shop and to uh, vet their vendors and subcontractors. And then once you do that, you have to let them do what they're good at, right? Don't micromanage them, but trust their expertise. Um, if you're hiring an expert, do what they say. Do what they tell you to do, right? I'm, I'm not good at this myself because <laughs> I've been in charge for too long. So sometimes I have to remind myself, oh, I need to get back into that beginner's mind, that beginner state, try it a different way. And then level up together. Um, these clients in this picture I really love because um, they opened one location of a, of a upscale co-working space in Brooklyn, New York. And then as they expanded into uh, new parts of New York, into new cities and states on, in the Northeast, um, they kept using the same team of us, uh, me for marketing and PR, David here pictured on the right for architecture, um, and all of us got to level up together. And so um, we all kept growing professionally in our capacities because we were able to keep working with the same team. It's the same thing that you see with um, something like a, like a sports team. You know, If you've got the same uh, top five players on the Trailblazers, uh, they're gonna keep working together better and playing together better as time goes on. That was my personal life. Um, I was doing every uh, New Year's, I do a New Year's goal brunch where we do goal setting together. And um, the first year was 10 years ago. I got a group of friends together and we decided to set our New Year's resolutions together. And by saying, we decided, I decided, I said, guys, we got to do this. And they were like, you're kidding, right? And I said, no. And I brought worksheets and we did it. <laughs> and it actually went really well. And so it became an annual tradition. Um, we've done these goal brunches in Portland, New York, Seattle, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Austin, and then this year we'll do one in uh, Mexico as well. So um, what have I learned through doing these goal brunches? Um, that people deserve and love and thrive when they feel like they have a blank slate or a fresh start. Um, you need to let go of some of that baggage of past failures or um, repeated patterns and give people an opportunity to start fresh. Um, also, you do want to learn from failure. So if, if there has been a repeating pattern of things not working out, what, why was that? Let's take a pause and figure it out. And then there's a game that we play at every single goal brunch called um, speed work. And we play that at pregame as well. And the idea is someone breaks their challenge or the area where they're stuck or the goal they couldn't accomplish the previous year. And everybody else at the table brainstorms on their behalf and offers suggestions or advice or introductions or tangible help to help them move forward. And oh my goodness, you've never felt as warm and tingly as when other people are trying to help you overcome your challenge or obstacle or achieve your goal. And it's really magical. And so I highly recommend it. And then the last piece, the piece I didn't have until right before I started pregame was how to like the magic of the group and it really, really had to be together. And so where I borrowed from last was spiritual communities. And I use the term spiritual and even the term religion extremely loosely because I know they can be very triggering to some of us and maybe didn't have a good experience early on, but spiritual communities survive and thrive all over the world. And that can mean anything from traditional church on the corner to a meditation circle like this, to your yoga class, to your CrossFit gym. Um, people feel very religiously about <laughs> some of their personal practices. And I was thinking about like, what makes these groups work, especially the groups that have the same people who are really loyal who keep showing up 
over and over and over. And some of the things, um, you know, especially when they're volunteer only, a lot of spiritual communities, uh, no one's getting paid to do the work, right? They're doing it out of some intrinsic motivation. And some of the things I pulled from that is, is that we all show up with the, um, on the basis that we're not perfect and having that level of vulnerability and acceptance that we all can keep leveling up in some way is really important. But that there's a possibility for growth that we can keep growing um, and, and that there are answers out there and that with others help that we can, uh, you know, grow into our fullest uh, selves. And then the power of the group over the in individual. So how are we, um, how are we building in the structure where the community uh, is, is just as, if not more important than the individual? And you know, one of my forms of spiritual practice is volunteering. When I first moved to Portland in 2014, and I didn't really have a sense of the landscape, and I didn't have like a full social calendar yet, I decided to start um, volunteering on Friday nights, and that became um, my church of sorts, my spiritual practice. And there's no way of doing service. If there are other people involved, or at least <laughs> other beings, whether it's the environment or animals, whatever you like to volunteer and do service around. And so the idea of service, which is very much rooted in a lot of spiritual traditions, just can't be done so. I took all of these things together and I put them into a structure that we call pregame. Um, pregame is what we like to say is that it's like a gym for your goals. Um, until COVID, we had a beautiful space in the Pearl District in Portland, Oregon, where people had a subscription, a membership, um, and I should say have, because we do it the same exact way now, only it's over Zoom. Um, but people have a membership, and every day we have groups um, where people come, talk about their goals, and um, we hold them accountable for that action, work together to help them solve where they're stuck and have challenges and obstacles, and help them clarify what the next steps are. We do uh, that element of having a map. When people start out at pregame, I ask them where they want to be in a year, and then we identify what their priorities should be in the next 90 days to get them on the path to getting there. And then they join a small group called a home team where, um, where they are able to set goals in a group, stay accountable for them, and the group is all together working to make sure that they keep moving forward. Um, there is a freedom to fail there. Um, if people don't achieve their, what we call their top three, um, top three is the top three things that they need to do in the next week to keep moving forward. If they don't achieve it, then we take a pause and we figure out like, well, what got in the way? Was it something legitimate or uh, were you just avoiding it? Um, let's try to figure that out so it doesn't happen again. Or maybe you were setting goals that were too big, or maybe you were setting goals that were too small. There's a lot of different factors that can go into it. And um, it was really important to me that, that this happened in small groups. Um, you know, on this theme of the individual is not as strong as the team. Um, you know, I don't have all the answers. And what kept me from calling myself a coach for a long time is I, I didn't like the idea of, of one person can tell you everything that you need to do to move forward. Um, I really like the, the magic of a team um, and multiple people who are experts in all different areas being able to contribute. We're also industry agnostic and so that's really important because um, when it comes to the mechanics of, of the product area of your business, it's important to know how it's done in your industry. For example, if you are um, a general contractor, there are just things you're going to have to know about how that industry works, how to price a project, um, how to get materials, uh, how it works with zoning in your city or your county. But when it comes to uh, building a business, scaling, especially when it comes to marketing uh, and sales, it's, it's better and more creative, in my experience, to borrow from other industries and repurpose ideas. And that's what what creates game-changing business models. Um, and so I try to keep our groups diverse in industry. Um, I would like to say in, in diverse in other areas, but I would say most of our clients have in common that they're at the peak of their careers or um, really at that growth 
changing point, that, that first growth spurt of their business. Um, and so in that way, they are, they have that in common. So with all of that, after I've told my story, my bio highlight reel, um, I would like to hear a little more about yours. Where have you felt freedom? So this is like freedom to be yourself, right? To not have to like put on a mask or, um, or be a certain thing or fit a certain mold. So where have you felt freedom? Trust, which we talked about, and possibility, right? The ability to create something new in a group. And what were the contributing factors? So I just shared um, about eight points in my biography, but I would like to hear yours, um, especially if you wouldn't mind raising your hand and sharing on the screen. Where have you felt um, a sense or what have you learned from a group that you were part of before um, some best practices for groups or teams? Any of your experiences on teams or in groups of any sort in life. Maybe it was sports, maybe it was the arts, maybe it was a work team, maybe it was a spiritual group, maybe it was a service community. Um, was there a time that you felt totally free to be yourself and that you trusted everyone that you could create and that you had open possibilities for what you could become? And I'll put the question on the, on the screen one more time. We, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Kim chat. She raised her hand, so here we go. Great. Hi there. It's so nice to be here. And Lori, thank you for letting me in. I, you you saved me. Uh, I was late coming in. Uh, thanks. Uh, it, I have several instances, but one that stands out to me was uh, because I don't have a tech background. Uh, my background is primarily medical and uh, going from biology to business. But I was in a tech startup and I hired nine people, including developers. That is a realm that I know absolutely nothing to very little about. But the, the connection part was uh, when we were dealing with potential clients and getting feedback from them, I invited the, the programmers to go with us to meet these clients. And they, they were medical clients because it was about an interface for communicating with patients that have strokes or cerebral palsy or something. And I, I was so gratified that the developers, the, the programmers said that was the best thing that they'd ever seen in, in working and writing programming because they got to see what the end users needed and the people that have no idea what programming is like. And it really changed how they would look at how they wrote co the codes and how they wrote the programs. So, and it also just bound us together as a team so much better. Awesome. Nice to see you, Kim. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, anybody else? I mean, maybe in your personal life, like let's repurpose something that's not work to something we could maybe incorporate into our businesses. Was there a time you were part of a group where you really felt a lot of freedom to be yourself and to be creative? I just thought of another one. Um, some of you guys probably know Lindsay Murphy. She um, created a group, a small group. There were like four of us and, and we were going through the artist's way like a little over a year ago and getting together to talk about it. So the artist's way is a, a workbook about kind of uh, resurfacing your creativity and I didn't even know the other people in the group but I um, because we were uh, doing this creative work together that was talking about like your inner artist I felt really free to to tap into parts of myself that I had not tapped into since I had been a professional artist. Susan would you like to share? Yes, I'm happy to share. Um, so I'm actually recently over the last couple of months been a part of a group. I, I work in the HR space and a fellow practitioner posted something on LinkedIn about just kind of 
uh, wanting to kind of um, overhaul what we know about the HR world. And a lot of the systems and structures in the HR world were kind of failing us after George Floyd. And because of that, we actually um, started a little collective where there's about seven of us and we are hoping to provide a space for other HR people to come together and, and find ways of doing things differently um, because the traditional way hasn't necessarily always been great. So um, I've never met any of these people in person. We have only ever met on Zoom and um, it's a place where we, I feel very safe to be myself and, and not judged and it's really awesome. That's awesome, Susan. I'll share that um, one of the times I felt most trusted and creative um, and useful was when I worked as a hospice social worker. And this goes back to what you said about really clearly defined rules. And I think a lot of the folks on this call probably also work on multidisciplinary teams. And in that role as a social worker, I also worked with a nurse and a bath aide and a chaplain and a volunteer coordinator and a physician. And so we all brought our expertise and there were some clear delineated roles of Lori's gonna ask about this and the chaplain's gonna ask about this. But then of course, there's also this overlap because although the chaplain's primary role is to provide spiritual support, if my client would like someone to say the Lord's prayer, um, fortunately, that's committed in there, right? And so that ability to clearly know what your team or the patient or customer is going to call um, call upon from you, you know that. But then there's also back to what you said about helping your other partners look good, right? That you set everybody up for success so that the patient wins or so that the client wins. And, and you don't have that competition or scarcity or fear that gets in the way of how that team works together. Yeah, that's a great example. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Burning Man. I have not because it scares me. But from what I understand, it is exactly this kind of environment that I'm talking about <laughs> where you feel a lot of freedom and trust people you've never met and feel possibility for creativity. Oh, I love it. Um, I want to share that Marty Nelson, uh, who is a shared colleague and pre-gamer, um, is, it says that he likes when he's being praised for very specific positive qualities that he brings to the team, right? Because it, um, expounding on you, Marty, but it helps us feel seen. It helps us feel validated. And it's not just that like blanket praise, great job, Ciara. Um, good job, Marty, but that we're, we're specifying how our contribution has helped the greater success. Yeah, thanks for saying that, Marty. I think we all know if we've ever been in a romantic relationship or been a parent that <laughs> giving people specific positive feedback, like, I really like it when you do X, Y, Z, it can be good for positive reinforcement. Anything else anyone want to bring up? If not, I'll move right on. All right. So uh, I never want to give a talk without giving you some of my very best practices or learnings in a certain topic, although I think you've probably gleaned a lot of them already. So here are some pro tips for you uh, around building trust on teams. Um, of course, sometimes we sabotage the trust. And so what should you not do is what I wanna talk about. This is BC Boys for those of you who don't know the reference. Um, here is what undermines trust on teams, perfectionism. So um, I'm a recovering perfectionist as I assume some of you are as well. Um, I used to think I had to look like I had it all together all the time in order for people to respect and like me. It turns out the opposite is true. People like me and respect me more when I'm honest about what I can and cannot do, um, when I ask for help, and when I, you know, without 
you know, overdoing it, admit, you know, where I have struggled and um, how I've dealt with things. And so that always brings the team together a lot faster. Um, I think if you are in a situation where you have to create a team very quickly, starting out with some uh, vulnerability as a leader can be a really effective tool to uh, relax people <laughs> when they're uh, becoming part of a new team. Um, number two, unsolicited advice. This is a big one. So um, in a lot of communities, business, spiritual, personal, uh, people like to give advice when they haven't been asked for it. And so, um, you know, sometimes you're in a role where you are supposed to be guiding and directing people, but um, you wanna make sure that if you're not, you ask for permission. And so if you have some way to help people out, first you wanna of course ask yourself whether it's actually necessary to be telling them how to do what they're doing. Um, but I find it's really effective simply to ask for permission um, to say, hey, can I share with you what worked for me in that situation? Um, or, uh, hey, do you want some feedback on that? And then just, just couching the advice with the question, um, makes it welcome or at least makes it heard. Free overwork. So, um, you know, we're all sort of getting over the, uh, the, the thing that's really been prevalent in the last 10 years or more, um, which is kind of bragging about how busy you are and how you're so busy and don't have time for anything. And I worked X number of hours this week um, is not, not something to lord over other people anymore. So overworking and um, trying to outperform everyone does not bring uh, a team together. It just uh, creates an environment of competition and burnout. Poor boundaries. I'm sure we've all experienced this, been on the receiving end of a poor boundary or been the people to have poor boundaries. So this could be um, bringing personal conversations into a professional setting. Um, we know there's some, some things that are very taboo in a professional setting to talk about. Um, maybe explaining to people why you were absent or why you were late, that's maybe too personal. That's different than being vulnerable, right? Like some things just don't need to be talked about or you need to build the relationship and build the trust before you go there. Um, there's also kind of blaming other people, having poor uh, boundaries where you're blaming other people for things that aren't really their fault um, and not taking personal responsibility. And that goes really well with lack of self-awareness, you know, doing, doing your own work on yourself, whether it's reading Lori's book, Fuckery, or uh, doing your own virtual therapy besides talking with your business therapist, whether it's a friend, um, or anything else you do, whether it's uh, exercise, meditation, or any other practices you do for your own self-development, um, all of those are going to help you be better at work because it's going to help you spot when you're doing the other four things um, and, and make you more aware of the effect you have on other people and when you perform best on your own as well. I want to talk a little bit about the future of trust before we do Q&A. Um, now that we're in this post-COVID world and we're working remotely and uh, working from home and uh, my last hire was entirely remote. We didn't meet a person until she was hired, um, which is really intimidating for a boss. And I'm sure all those of you who are hiring or those of you in HR um, understand that there's all new challenges in, in this remote world. Um, uh, and I actually got this, this slide just got added at the last minute yesterday because I was at a TED, TED talk um, where I am and, and someone was talking about um, the future of teams in, in this post-COVID world is really judging people by results versus process because we can't see their process as well as when we are in person together in an office. And so um, being really clear on what results are uh, expected and when and how, um, there's gonna be less how and more what and when going forward. Um, it's gonna demand from us even clearer communication. Um, our communication might have been verbal or verbal communication in the past, and now written communication is becoming even more important. Uh, the way we organize projects 
deadlines, goals, and so on, roles as well. Um, transparency, uh, which is something that people uh, talked about before, um, how it's going, how your day is going, <laughs> what's stressing you out. People can't read your body language and your micro expressions the way they used to be able to in person. And so being forthcoming about what's going on within reason um, is going to be really important. And masks off. Of course, I don't mean your coronavirus protective masks. I mean the masks you wear to hold people at arm's length in the workplace. Um, of course, now we can see each other's houses in the background. Um, sometimes we get those pet cameos and those kid cameos. Uh, we're all becoming real people. And I think that's just what's needed right now too. Um, don't fear it, embrace it, move forward with it. Um, people are gonna want that from each other, but also from brands. Um, you know, I'm finding that on a very small scale, the social media posts and um, the external communications that are best received are those that are the most personal and um, aren't coming necessarily with the perfect set, the perfect lighting and the written script. Um, people want that authenticity and they wanna see the flaws now more than ever. So take off those camera filters, unmask your background and uh, let's keep it real. All right, that's me, crpressler.com is where you can find me. Uh, you can email me at pdx at pregamehq.com. I'll send this to you as well. Um, and you can at me on the socials at the mayoress. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time. Well, I'd love to hear a question. Yes, that was fantastic. So this is where you can hear like our, you know, big round of applause. It's certainly, you know, as a presenter, as a keynote speaker, <laughs> it's very strange uh, to not have that constant engagement and feel the energy of people in the room. But I can tell you that I have pages of notes. And while folks are thinking of questions, I have plenty to ask you. Um, it doesn't matter that I share a Zoom call with you every single week. I still learn something different from you um, in every setting. And I'm glad that I'm not going to worry about my perfect lighting and that you can see See that the sun has changed and you can see the blinds on my face and I'm just going to like keep it real. A um, couple of things. Let's start with this. You said one of the really important things for accelerating trust on team is that we hire well. Over your years of working with lots of leaders who are hiring, where do you see people screw this up? What are like some top three reasons top of mind on what gets in the way of hiring well? Sure. Number one is price over value hiring the cheapest person instead of the person who's going to deliver the most value for the company at the rate. So it's better to hire, it's better to hire a more experienced person for a few dollars more per hour than somebody who's totally beginner level for it saving a few bucks. And in, in the end, it's going to cost you more. And that goes for contractors as well. Um, the other thing that was really a game changer for me was getting my company values uh, written down and, um, and uh, hiring people who match those values. Um, people call that a cultural fit, but we know that cultural fit can sometimes be uh, not a great term because it, it keeps, uh, keeps diversity out of our companies. Um, but values is, is uh, something that's worked for me really well. Um, the question I asked when I was between two candidates in my last hire was, who do I trust to leave my company with when I'm gone? And the answer was really clear. Um, if I'm not there, who do I trust to handle things? Um, and so, you know, and, and then the self-knowledge thing comes out a lot because if you are hiring based on your ego, you're gonna just hire the person who makes you feel like a hotshot instead of the person that's gonna challenge you and make the company better. And so taking your your identity out of the company and thinking about what's best for the company itself um, is really important. Awesome. I want to remind people if you have a question for Ciara to go ahead and add it in the Q&A and we will um, read that aloud here. Uh, another thing you mentioned, Ciara, is the importance of creating a fresh start. And what that made me think of is 
I'm seeing a lot of fatigue with the business uh, owners and, and leaders that I'm working with. And, uh, you know, there was this huge struggle back in March, April, May, when we were figuring out what um, working through a pandemic meant. And then we worked through some of those kinks. But I know, you know, like here we are mid-November for those of us in the Northwest, like the days are already short and dark and the rain is coming. How would you suggest creating some fresh starts when we're having to do that? remotely, we can't, you know, all meet for a real happy hour, like any suggestions on how leaders, teams can create that sense of a new beginning, even though it feels like we're totally just stuck right in the middle of COVID life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, two things. I mean, one is understand what your self-care is, you know, is your self-care for you, what works for you? Like, for, for someone else getting a message, which might be it, for me, it's exercise, you know, like, and, and, and prioritize that above your work. The other thing is, you can't expect yourself to do 2020 the way you've done every other year, because 2020 doesn't look like any other year. And um, I did pretty well at the beginning of COVID because I, I, I'm good in a crisis. But when, after George Floyd, I really, like, lost my, I just kind of collapsed and I still had to show up at work, right? And so, um, you know, I got a really good piece of advice from somebody else who has their own business and she just said, protect your energy. And I gave myself permission then to not have to be friends with everyone, to not to have to hang out with everyone, to just fold into my inner circle where I really had all these elements of a great team, right? Like my, my best friends who have my back no matter what, and I, and I didn't have to, I gave myself permission not to show up at every event, not to say yes to every opportunity and really protect my energy because that's really all we had. And, you know, when needed, move my furniture around, create a new office space, move my environment around, go work from Oakland for two weeks, you know, like trying to find different ways to, um, to change it up because it can feel monotonous and like time is not passing when you've just been uh, living like a quarantine life. Yeah. Yeah. Elaine, do you have some questions there that are coming in? I do not see any, although Susan did raise her hand. I wasn't sure if she lowered her hand because there was another question. So Susan, please let us know if you have a question or if you'd like to um, put it in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, while that's oh, happening. There's, there's Susan. Hold on oh, just a second. Oh, where'd she go? Steven's popping up. Oh, sorry, Steven. <laughs> I guess he's right below, um, right near SU, right? Correct. <laughs> While you're doing that, Elaine, um, Sierra, I love, I wrote down the, the bit that you had just learned that regarding accountability, we're going to be judged by the results and not the process because we can't see the process. Any suggestions for, because uh, I'm hearing this a lot, where we are seeing some underperforming and the compassionate part of us is like, I know that employee is teaching children at home. I know that that employee is going through a really rough time. I know that this is um, a black or indig uh, indigenous person of color and um, they're not feeling safe to walk outside. How are, how are you suggesting that we bring both our compassion and also hold people accountable to the results, understand that productivity is low, but we still have customers and we still have things on demand. Do you have any advice on how we can do that with a bit more grace and positive results? Yeah, I mean, it, I just want to acknowledge that it's tricky because what I think in theory that I would do and what I would do in reality can be two very different things. Because in reality, like I love people and I love my team and I want them to be have happy, great lives. So the policy I would write in a vacuum when I wasn't dealing with actual people is not necessarily what I wouldn't enact in business. And so um, I guess when I'm thinking about my clients' companies, some of the problems they're having with their employees existed before COVID, mm -hmm. you know, and, and before um, this round of Black Lives Matter and before this eviction. And so it's just that they're really coming to a head now when it really matters because 
we are not filling the gaps in time with like small chats, like, did you do your thing or not do your thing? And so, you know, that's when it comes back to clear communication. If you just talk around the issue and you let people get away with it, you know, it's one thing, it's, it's this, I need this by this date. Mm -hmm. What do you need from me to get me that by that date? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't happen, why didn't it happen? You know, like, and I, I'm a big fan of self reviews. Like mm -hmm. when you do reviews, I give people something to fill out because I need to know if they have the self-awareness, like if they think they're doing a good job and they're not doing a good job, you know, we're at an impasse. But if they know they're not doing a job and they can explain why, then we could, we have something to work with. And so um, I think there's opportunities for that clarity. And, and you know, as, as we know, for those based in Portland, there is a version of Portland Nice where we talk around the issue instead of dealing with it head on and being clear in our communication is being nice because it gives people something to act on. Thank you, thank you. That's really helpful for me and I'm, I'm sure for others too. Susan, are you able to check in with us? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm not sure how to, if it's a, a question or a comment rather, but really around um, what you were you were talking about with you know connecting individual values and um, having that be what connects people to their job and, and to the work that they're doing. And I think, that there is becoming more and more, um, it's becoming more and more apparent, you know, that maybe the company you work for either does or doesn't align with maybe your personal values. And I was just curious of, of your thoughts on um, like how as an individual, do people navigate that if they're finding that there's a misalignment there and, you know, how do we get people to uh, be happy and satisfied if that is something that isn't necessarily um, connecting and what do you think that will be like in you know a kind of a post-COVID world? Thanks this is an awesome question and um, and it gives me a chance to talk about things I really care about <laughs> so um, I just okay so first of all values are not like the words you have like screen printed on a t-shirt or painted on the wall they're what you do right they're they're what guide your decision making. And so it's really easy, you know, like if you think of something like a TV version of a startup or something where they've got all the words of their values and then like the bosses do the exact opposite thing. I think we do that more than we realize, you know, like are we really acting in those values? So it's very easy to like pass out a one sheet to all the employees or put it on a web page where our values are but what they actually are can be something really different. So I think, you know, the first step internally in a company is to take a look at what are our values really based on how we're behaving. Because you might be sending mixed signals to somebody and somebody took a job at your company thinking your values were the things on your website. And really when they get in there, that's not what you mean, or you only mean it in certain situations, right? You're not consistent, right? So that breaks the trust. Um, so I had this incredible experience this summer where I got to lead um, the strategic planning process for Portland Fire and Rescue. And the thing about doing that for like a public organization versus like an entrepreneur is that everybody gets a say in it. So it was really intimidating for me, somebody who I usually work with one or two people on, on, on a business plan or a game plan to do this with a department of 700 people plus a lot of stakeholders in the community. And so, um, what had happened was I first started working with the chief on what her personal leadership values were. And then we pulled that over to what are the department values and where's the overlap. And then we took that and we did a lot of interviews with everybody at every level of the organization on what was important to them and what their priorities were. And then we did a lot of rounds of editing of exactly how we were gonna word those values. And the thing we got to that was so interesting is like, oh my goodness, we only have one value. Everything else is under the umbrella. And what they got to was every life has value. So when you see, if you go on their website and you look, it's all public information at Portland Fire and Rescue's strategic plan, the values, so number one is every life has value. And underneath that is excellence in firefighting. Because if we don't have that, we can't value people's lives and save them. Underneath that is equity. 
right? Underneath that is respect um, and community and partnerships. And so I realize in my company, I only have one value and that's creating a win-win. So that's what drives my decision-making is, is this a win for me and the client? Is this a win for me and the employee? Is this a win for me and the partner? Like, I don't want to ever feel like I'm manipulating somebody or that I'm losing out on something. Like, how can I make this a win-win? And a lot of times where I hesitate in business strategy is I can't figure out the win-win. So, um, you know, there's a lot of processes you can do to, to work on values, but I mean, that's such a huge part of trust, right? Like, is what you say your values are and how you live it the same thing? Well, and I want to, that's awesome. And, and I love that crystallization of, yes, all these values are important, but this is the one overarching one. Um, I, I appreciate, Susan, your question. And, and you said earlier, Ciara, about um, when we were talking about boundaries or communication, that, that there are these, you know, taboo subjects at work. And yet I think, you know, another webinar is that how is that changing, right? Because it used to be that you don't, you don't talk about, you don't talk about politics, sex, or religion, right? And politics, we're seeing more and more businesses are connecting their values to what's happening in a larger political landscape. And businesses are being held to which candidates are supporting and which national policies they're supporting, et cetera. So we're seeing that change. Um, you um, dared to name the role of spirituality in um, self-care, in talking about business. And there are some people that say, yay, Ciara, thanks for talking about that. And other people that go, why is she bringing that up, right? So I, I really appreciate some of the struggle that I hear in Susan's question, because I think it's there for a lot of us, which is, how we're building trust on our teams or even feeling connected in our business when some of our values around the economy or healthcare or black lives or equity or any number of things are showing up and being talked about at work in a way that they didn't used to be. Um, anything else you wanna to add to that? They were never talked about. It's just that one set of values and, and world perspectives was assumed and was the default and everyone just had to get in line. So I, I just think, you know, <laughs> I was at a election, you know, kind of like watch event last week and um, there were two guys there who didn't vote. And I'm just, you know, and I was like, how nice for you that you don't have to be political. Like some of us don't have that option. And so, um, you know, like if you're in business, things are political because employment will comes from politicians, like how much, how many taxes my business pays is political, you know, like, oh my goodness, how could it not be, you know? And then, and then when it comes to the, the spirituality comment, you know, a lot of your companies are implementing wellness programs and meditation, it's like meditation comes from a spiritual tradition. So don't pretend that you're not bringing it in and, and call it what it is as you evaluate it. Because, you know, I, I think, on the same hand, it's not fair. I, I have this is another talk, but I have an issue sometimes with wellness programs being in business because, you know, you might not find meditation to be, um, you know, like denomination, but I might, you know, as in, and I don't have a choice as your employee to, to opt out of it. And so, you know, these things creep in by virtue of humans make up businesses and humans are you know, on some level of the spectrum of politics and spirituality and all this. Thank you. Um, Elaine, are there other questions coming in we need to acknowledge? I don't see any at this point. Okay, so if you still have them, we've got about uh, 10 more minutes for questions, so please don't be shy. Um, I do have another question for you, Ciara. You were talking about the importance of trusting others' experience. And you also shared that, like, you can say it, but that doesn't mean you always do it. So any tips for those of us who are still working on delegating, those of us who are still figuring out how to do this better, um, what are some good practices or strategies that we might use to make this trusting others' experience more of a habit? I mean, it's a practice, right? It's a muscle that you build. And um, 
So, you know, at pregame in those small groups I, I mentioned, we have a topic every week and last week's topic was multiplayer goals. And this week's topic is OPP in a nod to 90s hip hop group Naughty by Nature, other people's projects. And so like, when are you stepping on other people's toes and not delegating and not um, outsourcing where you should? And a lot of it is, you know, yeah, you set yourself up for success by hiring well and putting the right people in the right roles, right seats on the bus. Um, but the other part is that you have to just practice the muscle of like delegating a thing, waiting to see whether it works or not. And, you know, you don't start with the most important thing that can't afford to be messed up, but um, you do just have to be like, you figure it out. And I, I err on that side too much where I, I, I'm like, oh yeah, everyone can do everything. And, uh, you know, like I believe in people so much that sometimes it can be a fault because it's like, oh wait, they haven't learned that yet. You know, so yeah, eventually they'll be able to do that, but they maybe don't know what I mean by what I'm saying. And so, you know, sometimes I will just do that, be like, you know what, you do it the way that you think it should be done when we can afford to spend the time on that. Um, but there's always some things like that where you can just practice building the muscle of delegation. Um, but again, it still comes back to that clear communication in the first place about what the parameters are. Yeah. Well, and it makes me think too about um, the other tip you gave around transparency, that if I know that I'm still struggling to delegate, or if there's any part of me that might show up as a micromanager when I'm really under stress, that that self-awareness is that I might share that with my team. Hey, y'all, I'm still working to be a stronger delegator and to give clearer timelines or be more clear about um, what's expected. Or I know sometimes I have this vision and I failed to like communicate that with everybody else. When I do that, please let me know. I'm trying to be more mindful, but y'all can hold up that mirror for me too. And, and I think letting the people that we know, uh, that we work with, know that we're working on things shows that we we know that we're not perfect, which then communicates, I know that you're not perfect also. And it doesn't make it other people's responsibility to coach me and do my professional development, but it is a level of vulnerability and and that maybe people won't respond immediately because I have to earn that trust. They have to, Ciara has to be like, oh, Lori means it. Like she's totally breathing down my neck. And so I'm going to be like, Lori, remember when you said you wanted to know if you were micromanaging? Yeah, you're doing that, right? But that recognizing, depending on our role in the company and the kind of power that we bring, people aren't always able to give that kind of open feedback, right? And again, back to that bit of consent that we need to make sure we're asking consent for giving feedback and, and giving advice so it's not unsolicited. Yeah, and knowing those boundaries, like what you said, that someone else isn't in charge of my professional development, and no one's in charge of my personal development either. And I've definitely been, in, I was at a company where where my bosses, it was a family business, which is always like tricky too, but they had like really specific personal development practices, which I would call spiritual practices. And so they wanted like, they wanted me to like be doing the same things at the same time, and that's just not where I was in my life at that point. And I think because um, what, I, what I consider to be a, another area of spirituality or religion, like the positive thinking movement has very much infiltrated its business. And um, oh, one of the best editorials I've ever read is by Oliver Berkman. I will put his name. And he talks about um, the advent of like people needing to be happy at work all the time. Um, and, and how that's not really, he wrote an amazing book uh, called The Antidote, um, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking, and how it can actually hurt a business if everyone's happy all the time, because there's nobody to be like, hey, this might be a problem, like, we need to prepare for this eventuality, and, um, you know, like, we have to be tolerant of people's different ways of being in the world, and, and, uh, you know, some people are going to be more direct communicators. Some people are going to be more polite, or you know, it doesn't necessarily mean those things are wrong. They might be cultural, uh, which is something we really need to be paying attention to right now. Is is am I discounting this way of person's way of being because it's not from my culture? Um, so, so yeah. So 
not expecting everyone to be where you are in your personal development journey, I think is really important too, and not necessarily to speak the same language. Yeah. Well, and you know, on the topic of how do you accelerate trust on teams, yes, it's helpful to have encouragement and acknowledgement and validation. And if there's oppressive positivity, which is a term that my friend Aaron Donnelly introduced me to, that does not create a safe place to say, Ciara, I'm really struggling with the new policy. Because if I'm scared that I'm in any way disagreeing with you or sharing something out loud that like, I'm really worried that this is gonna have a risk to the customer, right? If I feel like you demand positivity from me all the time, then we're not gonna learn about problems. And there's a role for the cynic and the skeptic, right? Like it's, it's hard if that's the only role they play or if they're too loud all the time. But I think when we're assessing our teams, we need to look at who's willing to directly say, this isn't working, there's a problem here. And if we don't have people on our team saying that, then we as a leader need to look at is oppressive positivity part of what's happening. Yeah, there's, um, I won't, I don't know why I won't name names, but there's a, there's a personal development company that has a professional development arm and their, their style is very like complete personal responsibility. Like nothing is no one else's fault. You take responsibility for everything in your life. And they do these corporate trainings and like one of their big clients, of course, is like Lululemon and all that. And, you know, the kind of like, emperor has no clothes in, in that sort of professional development is like, how can, how can employees ever have a problem with oppressive policies in a company if everything is their own fault? So like, are you, you know, are you as a company implementing some personal development workshop or meditation or something like that so that your employees won't have a problem with being expected to work 16 hours a day? Like, like who cares if there's a meditation pod in your cool office if people don't ever get to go home? Like <laughs> where, at what point do we need to have like ethical workplace standards, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, getting some good comments here from Emily about uh, power being privilege and saying it's on you and that you own it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that just reeks of um, mm -hmm. those in power maintaining their power and, and asking certain people to hold the responsibility for things that are bigger than us. And of course, like, I'm no fan of playing the victim and I'm no fan of, you know, complaining and excuses and making it always somebody else's fault. But we, to say that it's an all or none kind of a thing is binary thinking, right? And, and um, that's, that's not how we develop trust either. Um, any questions uh, coming in here? Uh, or anything that like uh, in the last couple of minutes you are that you're like, oh, I forgot to mention, we still have just like a minute or two. I, I'll ask you this. You've provided so many amazing like points and things for us to think of. And I, I took a lot of notes, but I am looking forward to some of those highlights of um, uh, what we can do to put trust in action. As this audience walks away, if they could only remember one thing, what is that thing that you want to send us out the door thinking about and acting on? Clarity. Be clear in where you're going, clear in your communication, clear in who, who's doing what, what the roles are, deadlines, <laughs> what you mean by your directions, you know, clarity. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if you guys, I always want people to leave with an action. So if you can put in the chat box or um, even just thinking as you, as you depart, uh, what is an action that you could take based on this information? And maybe it's just going back over that Trello project and figuring out where you could be more clear or adding deadlines to your task list or um, checking in with somebody on your team to make sure that they got the instructions that you gave. Uh, just think about what way you could turn this into an action. Love it. And I want to give people a minute to do that because um, saying our action out loud or writing it down, even if you're sharing it with strangers on a Zoom call, I want you to think about what is one action, one area that you can add more clarity to and just put it in there. It doesn't need to be clear for all of us to understand, but you know that you did it and it's going to like boost the chance that you actually follow through. So uh, let's see some ways that we're going to take clarity out the door with us today. 
And while those are coming in, Elaine, you're so great at managing tech in the background. Do you have any final questions for Ciara or things that you're taking with you? I don't have any questions, but I do want to say thank you for your time today. I think that, you know, we live in such abnormal times that I totally agree. Being honest and clear with people um, is really a benefit to yourself. Um, we are so vulnerable right now um, because of the life that we live, because of the pandemic, because of the restraints on our personal lives and our professional lives, that to really um, continue the relationships that we have and to build new relationships, I think we really need to be honest with ourselves and with our, the people around us. So they know where our boundaries are, where our truths begin, where we're comfortable. Um, and because we are in lack of, you know, in-person experiences and we only have Zoom and phone calls, um, being very clear about what you need and what you want, I think is so pivotal to maintaining and building those relationships. So I think it's, it's definitely something that we've all thought about, but to say it out loud and to really think about how that benefits every aspect of your life and how that comes back around to you and is beneficial to you, your business, to the people that report to you, to your family members, to your partner is, is really impactful. So I just want to echo that. I think that that is the, one of the clearest um, clarifying uh, <laughs> takeaways from, from this, from this talk today. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, uh, if I can add one more word, it would be grace, grace to yourself when you get it wrong and grace to others when they're still figuring it out and growing because um, I know that that we as a community and as coworkers become more divided when we need everyone to be doing things exactly the way we want them to do them right now. And so being, being uh, gracious is gonna help us unify and move forward. Thank you. Beautiful way to end. Thank you so much, Ciara. Thank you, Elaine and 52 Limited for being uh, co-sponsors of this event. All of you uh, uh, participating today, you can look for a follow-up email that'll come to you via 52. It'll have upcoming webinars uh, that I mentioned. Crystal McGinney will be um, with this series on December 10th and Cage Leitner uh, will be speaking with us in January. Both of those um, links are up on Eventbrite. Um, in your email, you'll also uh, see some additional services um, available through Radius and have CR's contact information, as well as the really juicy content, the highlights of her presentation as well. If you do have questions for Elaine, Ciara, and I, you have our social media handles or emails. Don't hesitate. And let's uh, end with Ciara's word for grace, grace for ourselves, and grace for each other. Thank you so much, y'all. Have a great day. Thanks, all.